Thank you, Andrea. Good, uh, good morning. It's an honor and a privilege to once again serve as the moderator for our panel. Um, I think you'll find this a fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, the central theme that, that, as you will see, weaves through these, these papers are, is reform as well as trade. Uh, I'm going to shorten the bio introductions in the interest of time, but I commend you to read the entire bios in the handout because these are extraordinary. Uh, on my right is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Blake, who is a deputy for individual training and learning at the Joint Staff J7 in Suffolk, Virginia. Next is Patrice Brene, sorry, Major Patrice Brene Masipe of the Guardia Civil, who is currently serving in the General Middle Academy of Spain, uh, known as the General. Um, next is Laura Huber, a PhD student, political science at Emory University. Her paper, I think, will uh, be very eye-opening as it runs in some ways counter and in some ways concurrent with some of the things you've heard so far. And then Sarah Schroeder, contractor for the Navy in Washington, D.C., with an extensive background in the private sector of government operations. Uh, and she's going to talk about reforms to the U.N., so there's some brief interesting dovetailing with our last presentation. And not take any more time. Dr. Lake, the podium is yours. Good morning. It's great to stand in front of a group of friends and for this great symposium once again. Thank you, Mary, for bringing us all together. I have a lot to talk about today. I only have 15 minutes, as we've already heard. We're on a time crunch. So if there's things that I bring up and only touch upon, please feel free to talk to me during one of the breaks or, or later on. So through some of the work that I had been working on through PME in the past, professional military education, I had heard about this mandate of women, peace, and security. And each of those reporting resolutions after that called out training as a requirement within the resolution. The UN's action plan developed in 2005 specifically calls out training in several different areas in regards to the topic and say that each of the member states needs to develop a national action plan and that plan must include and require training for their personnel. My current position as an education specialist on the joint staff at the J7 is we deal with policy, but also how to implement that policy. So when it came time for me to do some research for my dissertation, I had a number of different topics I was considering, and my dissertation chair actually said, we need to do some work on this women, peace, and security. It sounds great. Why don't you do a comparative study on how the U.S. is doing in regards to implementing a training program compared to what NATO and partnership or peace countries are doing? And so that's what I'm going to talk to you today about, is my research results and what I found, which maybe is a little bit of a surprise. So I started with a purpose statement, and I'll read it right here. It's to provide a means of determining if U.S. military units are behind or ahead of North Atlantic Treaty Organization or NATO and partnership for peace countries in regards to gender awareness training in support of UNSCR th Resolution 1325. It will provide a cross-country cross examination of how militaries in specific countries are institutionalizing gender as a planning factor that will assist in operational effectiveness and any cultural considerations. The resulting information will assist in determining if there are areas in the U.S. implementation of the National Action Plan that could be improved upon based upon the work conducted by other countries. So my research questions were rather basic, but it was, are U.S. military units behind or ahead of the NATO countries? And what are they doing, the U.S. military units are doing in regards to implementation? And what are the NATO Partnership for Peace countries doing? So those are the basic two general ones. And then what are the factors that might have contributed to the outcomes of these questions? Things such as are there cultural barriers or other factors that might affect the support of the training? Have the countries developed a particular position on their staffs that is specifically in place to advise on gender? And have professional military education institutions or the respective country of the respective countries inculcated gender awareness training as a standard in their curriculum? So for my research, my Subject matters, my members, consisted of one each from Canada, Norway, France, Germany, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Netherlands, and a partner country of Sweden. There were five members I interviewed that came from the U.S. So in total, the 12 members from eight countries included three men and nine women. These people were either ones that I worked with previously in, in past conferences and sessions and knew about, or ones that I heard about that would be a good person to talk to. There are mostly people in their 40s and 50s, and these interviews were conducted either in person or on the phone or via Skype. So the research was done in an iterative framework. I reviewed each of the national action plans from those countries that I just mentioned. 
And I could go into that in great detail, but I'm not going to due to time. But that was looking at and comparing all of their different national action plans and the different sections of them. But then also asking them and doing a series of interview questions, about 45 minutes with each of them. So through that, I looked at the themes that came out of those interviews, bucketed the themes to come up with my findings. So what are the findings? That's the main thing we're trying to find here and ask, talk about today. So are the U.S. military units ahead or behind the other NATO partner countries? Well, yeah. The U.S. does like behind most of the other countries that we interviewed. However, we really are not doing too bad, and we're really not alone. There are factors that contributed to how robust the training was in some of the other countries. So it ended up being not such a comparison of the good versus the bad, but kind of almost the bad versus the worst, because there's a lot of struggles that everybody is having. And we think we're behind, but there's a lot of other factors that are preventing us from going forward, just like there's a lot of other factors out there that the other countries are struggling with also. The U.S. is making inroads in professional military education. Most of the geographic combatant commands have at least a little time in the commander's orientation program to explain what WPS is. Training programs within the other countries are more robust. Of course, Sweden, we've already heard about, there's uh, the Nordic Center for Gender Military Operations. But there are other countries, such as Australia, Canada, Great Britain, they're starting to think about other programs also. But it all comes down to leadership. The support of leadership really is key. So all the countries did have some kind of a sexual harassment type training, which should no, no surprise, but we also are concerned about sexual exploitation and abuse training. That is something that most everybody is lacking in their training programs, just what that is and how to prevent it. And I'm sure Rachel will agree with me on that one also. The factors that contributed to the non-support of gender awareness training by any country included cultural aspects, that mainly the age of the leadership, realizing that this is now part of what the military is doing, fighting in an urban environment, remembering the rear area, not just the steel on target in the front, and basically having an understanding of what it is that's being discussed. Having a gender advisor on a staff certainly helps. It's a good indicator of support if the commander is willing to have that position, because most everybody says, I don't have the resources for this position. Where am I going to take that position out of? In regards to the inclusion of gender into PME curriculums, the U.S. is actually doing better than all the other countries at this point. Trying to include it as a topic is tough and has had its struggles, but it's at least being talked about with Mary here at, at Naval War College, with Naila at National Defense University, with Lauren at, at the Marine Corps, with Christine at the Army War College. You guys are doing it great and trying to include it within the curriculum. I didn't mention the Air Force. We're still trying to figure that one out. Still trying to cr crack that nut. But within the PME institutions, that is something actually the other countries have had not had the chance to really kind of talk about as much as they've had in the training programs. So you guys are doing great. That regards. There's still room that we can do, move forward. We've already talked about that, but the event yesterday will hopefully help with that. So what are the recommendations? Well, key leader engagement certainly is something, as I mentioned, that is important and critical for this agenda to go forward. And that's not a surprise to anybody here. We've already talked about that. The Nordic Center does do a key leader symposium. We did have one last September over in the United States at the NATO headquarters, there were two people from the United States that in attendance. The other 42 military officers, uh, key leaders of the general rank. The other 40 attendees were from NATO countries. So we agree that is something that we want to do more here in the United States. We have great plans to do that. We just need to get some stabilization within some of the positions within DOD before we can go forward and make that happen. Change the professional military education policy. We've tried to include this topic as a special area of emphasis. We were able to do that one year. The next two years, it was voted upon negatively to not be included. This year, we didn't even try. 
because I think there's another avenue that we need to try to take their approach. They're going to change the policy on the officer's professional military education policy. There's one sentence in there I'd like to read. Comprehend the roles that factors such as geopolitics, culture, region, and religion play in shaping, planning, and execution of joint force operations. It could be easy as just including the word gender in that sentence. There's also other, and you guys are already doing a great job under the table making sure this is, works, but maybe we can bring it forward in other ways, and that's something I think we can look forward to. Support the position of a gender advisor. We've had gender advisors in wartime. The current Resolute Support gender advisor is a U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Air Force. We've had them in the past. They haven't gone over as trained gender advisors, so. So if we have that position within our command, such as AFRICOM has one, PACOM has one that's double-hatted, and SOUTHCOM has a gender advisor. One of the first we heard about Admiral Tidd, he said he wants a gender advisor. He has an E-9 as a gender advisor. And First Corps has Master Sergeant Lowry as a gender advisor. We just need to have that awareness of what this position is and how that can help the commander when they are doing the operations. The inclusion of gender in more exercises. I could talk about Talisman Saver for a long time, just spent three weeks with a couple people in the audience doing that exercise. That was an objective of the exercise. It had its struggles, but at least it's an objective of the exercise. We need to include it in more of the exercises that the U.S. is doing. Sweden has been doing some of their Viking exercises. They have one coming up in 18. That's already a big part of this uh, Viking 18 exercise. And some other countries have included also. We just need to have the exercise designers and planners understand what this topic is and be able to include it in the exercise. Recruitment of women. The U.S. is doing very well. We're at the top of three countries that have the greatest number of, of women within the military forces. Now, that we've talked about integration of women and how that helps move this agenda forward. Sweden only has 7%. So yeah, they're doing great in their gender mainstreaming. They just need to get more women into their forces, and they readily admit that. <coughs> They'll say they're not doing well in that regards. Other countries have included women in their combat arms a lot earlier than we have, but they still don't have the women representation in that area either. So there's some work that can be done, but having the more women into the field like we're doing will certainly move the agenda along further. And the draft, and this again is what I mentioned for my dissertation defense back in November, draft an insights and best practices paper, some kind of a guiding document or a handbook that could be in addition to the implementation plan. Now, Christine, as in her work at PQSOI, is doing great in developing some kind of a handbook that can be a single guide, that be a desk side reference for those people who don't understand what we're talking about and say, look, here's what it is and here's how we can implement it. Just need to make sure it's on their desk, not on the bookshelf where it can gather dust. So the way ahead. Well, we've all heard about the WPS Act. We all thought it was dead. In May, it got a little bit more traction. We'll see if it makes any more traction. But there is one statement in there. Under this bill, DOD would be required to train personnel prior to deploying to certain regions on the importance of involving women in the following areas, conflict prevention, mitigation and resolution, protecting civilians from violence, and combating human trafficking. So if that bill does go farther, we're going to be busy and we're going to make sure this training does happen. We do need to include more exercises, like I mentioned, Talisman Saber did include a little bit of it. I had a promising call by a uh, Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel from the Pentagon who said, I just finished a planning conference for an interagency tabletop exercise, and I heard that you're doing some work in this area. We need to include it in the next exercises that we're doing up in the Pentagon. Now, they're doing a series of globally integrated exercises between the combat commands and also getting the Joint Staff and DOD to actually play in exercises. And if anybody's been in the exercise world, you normally have role players for those positions. Well, these are going to be people actually doing that job in an exercise. So to have this topic be included in a tabletop interagency exercise will be a great, great thing for you to make it happen. Now, we heard about, uh, um, Amanda Common talked about her work as far as unconscious bias 
I had a person approach me two weeks ago. He's a brand new observer trainer where I work. He's a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, a fighter pilot. And he did his paper, a war winning paper, at the Air War College on having a female voice and getting more female aviators into the Air Force and what an importance that is. And he has two young girls, but he says, I'm going to make this world a better place for my girls. And he talked to the CFPA, the Chick Fighter Pilots Association. <laughs> Chick Fighter Pilots. He goes, yeah, that's what they call themselves. And he interviewed them for his paper, and it was just amazing some of the things that they talked about. And so it's great to have this younger generation, the colonels of below, they're finally getting it and finally understanding how having a voice of the other 50% of the population can help move us forward. So I do teach at the Swedish um, Nordic Center for Gender and Military Operations for their gender advisor course. Fortunately, they've been, or well, I'm fortunate, they've invited me back every time. I helped develop the course and then have been teaching at the sections of uh, the last three. We have another one coming up in October. So Rachel, I'll take on that uh, mantra of getting more UN stuff into the course as we have our instructor prep time the first part of October. But there is an online course that's out there on gender awareness training that we developed four years ago with NATO that was more NATO focused, but we just recently revised it for Talisman Saber, and we did include more UN in there. And much to the chagrin of the NATO gender advisor, but we said, look, we've got to include more across the board. And so we did have that in there. And so that is an easy thing that I'm leaving for you all to use within your organizations. It's on Joint Knowledge Online. You can easily, anybody can get a, uh, an account there. If you are not associated with the military, whether it's another country or U.S., but you're a civilian, you can use me as a sponsor. I'll be glad to be your sponsor and just sign up and, and if you just Google in the search field, gender awareness, that course will come up. And then that will be a good way to get out to your, uh, the people within your institution. So I conclude with saying that, yes, we may seem at times we're behind some of the other countries in some areas that we are, but we really are doing some great things. And with this group here that keeps growing every year, I think we have a good momentum to move ahead and move that snowball over the big hill. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Good morning. I am Major Beatriz Bernabé First, I, I want to thank very much Mary for this opportunity of being here with, uh, with all of us. I belong to a police military corps, which name is Guardia Civil, and I currently assigned to the Humanistic Military Department at the General Military Academy from Spain, working as a teacher. Today, I am going to give a lecture with title is New Horizon in the Training of Spanish Officers According to Gender Perspective. For beginning, I'd like to begin to show a data chart of December of 2016 we can see that the 8% of women are officers in Spain, the 4.6% of women are not commissioned officers, and the 16.0% of women are in troops and sailors. I am going to divide this talk into five parts. Introduction, gender perspective in Spain, the Academia General Militar, historical background and our cadets, Gender perspective formation at the Academia General Militar, syllabus and additional measures, future vision and conclusions. Let's look now at gender perspective in Spain. With respect to military observatory for the equality of men of uh, women, uh, have uh, several functions among other. It analyzes, debates and makes proposals about the impact among men and women in terms of recruitment, military teaching, military career, and the conciliation between private, family, and working life. It follows and studies the suggestion of NATO Gender Perspective Committee and the action over women, peace, and security, especially in UN and NATO scope. It ensures the implementation of gender criteria in a statistic sources from the Ministry of Defense, in which the data were military personnel are gathered and processes separating both genders. Organic Law 3, 2007, intends both 
to fly, to fight, sorry, against all kinds of demonstration, which are still exist in terms of discrimination, direct or indirect, on the ground of sex, and promote the real equality among men and women, getting rid of obstacles and social stereotypes, which prevent from getting it. The plan of action of government of Spain for the implementation of 1,325 resolutions constitute the decisive political framework to incorporate the gender perspective in the prevention, management, and solution of air conflicts. Finally, the protocol of, of action against sexual harassment and by reason of sex, this protocol tries to keep on promoting the culture of zero tolerance in the air forces by the implementation of preventive measures and the victim's protection. The third one allows through information, formation and awareness to establish a good working atmosphere in the units so as to prevent and avoid a situation of sexual harassment. Whereas the second one, apart from establishing the non seal mechanisms, investigation and punishment of such behaviors, aim the integral protection of the victim by ensuring the right defense and avoid, avoiding sorry, harmful consequences. Now we move on to historical, historical background of the Academy. The General Military Academy was created in 1882, located in its first epoch in the town of Toledo. Since then, the General Military Academy has lived three epochs. First epoch in the town of Toledo from 1982 to 1893. During this period, the so-called so spirit of La General was born, which implies the cohesive feeling of currency and unity of origin. Second epoch in the town of Zaragoza from 1927 to 1930. The decalogue set of values and fundamental virtues that cadets have to seek and they are still received nowadays in different events and paradise, represent a brilliant example of educative co coherence. In this photo, you can read the first article of the cadet, the catalog, to have great love for the mother country and profess loyalty to the king, openly portrayed in all the events of their life. Third book, in the town of Zaragoza from 1940 until now, the curricular evolution has adapted the scientific and technological studies to the factors that have emerged from the conflicts, completing them with a necessary preparation in humanities and values. In the following three slides, we are talking about our cadets. Cadets of different corps and branches are trained at the academy. General Corps of the Army, they are integrated into different branches, infantry, cavalry, artillery, engineers, engineers, and signals. Quartermaster Corp and Polytechnic Engineer Corp, Defense Common Corp, Judicial Corp, Controller, Medics at the Unit of Music, and finally Civil Guard, Police Military Corp. The officer cadets of the Army remain four of the five year formation at the General Military Academy. The accept mode is with high school grade together with the MAC go to the university entrance exam. Moreover, they have to pass a second language test, English test, a physical test, and a medical checkup. The percentage of women in 2016 was 10.4%. The present syllabus set up since 2010 consists of 353 European credits and uh, 20 sorry, uh, 52 military training work weeks. Cadets are both commissioned as first lieutenant and graduated in the university degree of management engineering. Therefore, this is an all-round education, scientific, technological, humanistic, job training, and essentially a formation on values. The Defense University Center is an organization under the Ministry of Defense, currently attached to the University of Zaragoza and located inside the academy. The next issue, I, like, I would like to focus on syllabus in the field gender perspective in the academy. Analysis of the international, national, and specific regulation of the armed forces. Spanish constitution, universal right of equality of all people before the law. Armed forces royal regulations in which commanders 
are ordered to ensure the implementation of the criteria and regulation related to the effective equality of men and women and the prevention of gender violence. Organic Law 9, 2011, on rights and duties of the Spanish Armed Forces, there is no discrimination on the basis of gender or sex. And finally, Organic Law 8, 2014, of the Spanish Armed Forces Disciplinary Regime, the expression of content on grounds of gender are sanctions. We have a cross-curricular way through the study of principle of equality, principle of non-discrimination due to sex, treatment of women in air conflicts, practices and activities in relation to gender roles. Now we move on to additional measures around gender perspective. The instructor or professor gives both lectures to the new common students based on gender violence card and talks about information security, 16. All students and teachers attend lectures about the protocol of sexual harassment in the Spain Air Forces and the prevention of gender violence, in which the different ways of behaving are outlined in detail, whether victim or witnesses. Commanders are in charge of carrying out relevant proceedings to serve or sanction past events. Fifth year students and teachers attend some talks about gender perspective in order to correctly conclude the process of exteriorizing the gender perspective. This is a key aspect to carry out the common action in the present society. Participation and attendance of teachers and students to conference, congresses, and seminars. Turning to, to future vision, during this course, the Academy has created a working group of gender perspective, which is analyzing the current situation at the Academy and is searching for formative improvements in this area. In the short term, some initiatives have already been developed, such as the inclusion of a conference related to this topic at Cervantes Chair, or the proposal of doing, of doing some of the end of degree projects based on the topic of women, peace and security in the following academic years. In the medium term, to structure the teaching impacted, to analyze the presence of women in the front line and theater of, of operation, to train teachers, to make an international comparison with other armies and police military corps. And finally, in the long term, it is essential to lead research projects so as to contribute to make an even better end. To conclude, uh, there is a great concern of the Academy and the Spanish Armed Forces in women, peace and security fields. The gender perspective must be prevent alone, sorry, must be present along all the cadets' training period. The present syllabus is implemented in a specific and cross-curricular way, topics related to gender perspective, improving such a training with complementary actions. A working group has just been created with the aim of detecting formative deficiencies and needs in this field. And finally, the gender perspective must occupy an understanding place in the educational integral system, with basic pillar is the, format, is the formation in values. I would like to mention the teacher decalogue, and its Article 5 says, teacher will devote all the effort to the integral formation of the cadets, Conscious that ethical principles such as, such as maturity and professional capacity constitute a whole in their development as a person. Finally, I have said, uh, Prussian philosopher Kahn Emanuel, education is the development of all perfection that the human being, nature, is capable of. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lee. Next up, we'll be Laura Huber. Well, hello, everyone. And to echo all of the previous presenters, thank you to Mary and to the Naval War College for inviting me to come speak here today, as well as for hosting all of us in this conference. Um, and so the paper that I'm going to be presenting today asks a question that I think a lot of us have touched upon explicitly or implicitly in our presentations, um, and that's the basic question of why do we see such a large degree of variation among countries in compliance with UNSCR 1325. 
identified. Um, and I think that, as, um, as was mentioned, my paper is a little different in the way that I'm going to be approaching that question, as well as how I integrate into the theme of our conference today. And that's because I actually, um, in order to understand how we can amplify the WPS agenda in the future, first take a look back into how we have developed over the past 30 years, and to look at how various um, security sectors, specifically military and police forces, have adopted gender reforms and what has motivated them to adopt these policies. So specifically, this paper asks two main questions. First, it asks which countries are adopting security sector gender reforms, and then the second question is why are they adopting these policies? Um, and as I'll discuss more in a moment, this paper argues that while conflict, and particularly civil war, can be especially damaging to gender equality, it can also provide an opportunity for gender reform in the security sector, and that this process of conflict as providing opportunity for gender reform has changed and been amplified after the adoption of 1325. Um, but uh, first, I just kind of want to set the stage a bit for what I mean when I say variation in the adoption of gender reform within the security sector. Um, as I'm sure many of us know, um, only about 66 of uh, sorry, 66 states have adopted national action plans for the implementation of 1325, as well as the women's representation within the militaries ranges, sorry, military and police forces ranges between 0.5% to 56%. So we see wide ranges in women's participation in these forces, even though the UN, through UNSCR 1325, has specifically called on all countries to increase women's participation within the security sector. And yet, of 150 countries that I have surveyed, only 54 currently had publicly stated gender targets or quotas for increased recruitment of women into their military and police forces. So we see this variation in which, on one hand, some countries already seem to have implemented gender reform and have higher participation rates of women within their militaries, whereas other countries are starting to take are taking steps to attempt to improve gender representation within their militaries, and other countries are doing little to no attempt to reform their security institutions. And so this paper is really attempting to understand why we see such variation in these actions of countries. Um, but uh, just to kind of define the terms that I'm using before I go forward and explain uh, my theory, when I talk about gender reform in the security sector, I'm particularly referring to two types of reforms. The first are female ratio balancing reforms, which I'm just going to refer to as gender balancing reforms for the rest of the presentation. And these reforms are those that seek to increase the number of women relative to men within a security institution. And so for the purposes of my paper, I define this as five different types of policies. It includes the lifting of bans of women from certain types of positions, such as the removal of the female combat ban, as well as things like recruitment campaigns targeted at recruiting women, or the creation of an all-female unit or gender-specific unit, um, as well as the adoption of a national action plan for the implementation of UNSCR 1325, and, um, how many was that? That was four. The fifth one is escaping me, but it is in the paper <laughs> that you all will receive a copy of later. Um, so that's the first, our gender balancing, and that's what we've been talking about a lot when we talk about um, countries attempting to increase the physical representation of women within their security institutions. The second type is a broader category, which are gender mainstreaming Reforms. And these I define in my paper very broadly as any type of reform which seeks to um, change the gender culture of a security institution in order to promote gender equality. So this includes all of the gender balancing reforms that I just mentioned, as well as various other types of reforms such as gender training, as we have been talking about, the adoption of sexual harassment policies, um, or the creation of specialized equipment or facilities for women, along with various other types of policies. And then secondly, for the purposes of this paper, uh, my gender reforms that I'm going to talk to you and show you some results for are limited primarily to the police and military forces. Um, so um, when I look at why certain states are adopting these policies, 
um, compared to others. There are, of course, a number of different reasons that may motivate a country to adopt gender reform within the security sector. But in this paper, I look at how the experience of civil war, both while civil war is actively occurring and after civil war has occurred, can alter a state's level of political will and its ability to adopt gendered security sector reform. And particularly, there are five different ways in which conflict can help motivate gender security sector reform. The first is perhaps the most pragmatic, and that is that during conflict, the security sector increases, as well as there is a greater need for more mobilization into the security sector. And therefore, governments, as this demand increases and as it may outstrip the supply of available men, they may turn to women in order to fill the swelling ranks of the security sector. And therefore, you are likely to see especially gender balancing reforms to occur. Second, during and after conflict, we often see that traditional gendered stereotypes and gender roles may be challenged. This is obviously most explicitly related to the security sector when women participate in the conflict as combatants, as this can demonstrate women's agency as security officers, as well as it can help decrease any stereotypes that women are not suitable for the security sector, such as ideas that they are weak or nonviolent or innocent. However, even short of direct participation in the conflict, um, as combatants, women can also find other ways during conflict that may enable them to challenge traditional stereotypes that exclude them from participating within the security sector. For example, during conflict, women often gain increased roles within the economic sector. They may become the breadwinners for their families in the absence of their husbands or fathers. And additionally, they may gain greater roles within the community such as the leaders of their families, they may mobilize peace movements, and then they may also become politicians. Um, and then they may use kind of the uh, momentum that they gather during the war, taking over these roles of perhaps the missing men who are off fighting or who have been killed in order to uh, leverage their increased leadership after the war to gain greater access to the security sector. Third, um, kind of in contrast to that past the previous mechanism, um, during conflict, women often face grave levels of insecurity. They may be greater levels, especially to their physical, physical security, than they experience during peacetime. And therefore, as a result, the government may feel responsible and may feel that it um, can undertake gender reform as an attempt to specifically address women's increase in security during and after conflict. And similarly, um, during conflict, the legitimacy of the security sector is often damaged, and this is especially true during civil war, in which the security sector has potentially participated in violence against its own civilians. And therefore, the government may hope to leverage stereotypes that women are more peaceful or less corrupt and more trustworthy than men in order to regain some of their legitimacy in the eyes of the public. And then finally, during and after conflict, International actors often gain unprecedented access to policy making within the state. As we know, during conflicts, policy making abilities by the government may falter due to um, infrastructure destruction or due to political discord, and this may make it difficult for the country to pass policies. However, the international community, who then attempts to intervene in the conflict or after the conflict to promote peace, then gains a unique um, opportunity to influence policy making within the state. And as we know, the international community favors uh, the WPS agenda and therefore is likely to promote the adoption of gender reform within the security sector in the post-conflict state. Therefore, in this paper, I hypothesize that states that are either actively experiencing a civil war or have experienced a civil war within the past 10 years are going to be more likely to adopt both gender balancing and gender mainstreaming reforms within the security sector than non-conflict states. However, we might expect that the character of its gender reform within the security sector looks different within these conflict-affected countries. And in particular, while we, we will expect that active conflict countries are going to be more concerned with their personnel, and therefore they're going to be more concerned with gender balancing reforms in order, as I said, to follow through with that increased mobilization demand. And in contrast, post-conflict states are likely to be more concerned about their ideas of legitimacy and reputation, and therefore, they're going to be more concerned about gender mainstreaming reforms. So therefore, the second set of hypotheses is that while both 
conflict and post-conflict states are more likely to adopt these policies than non-conflict states, active conflict states should be especially more likely to adopt gender balancing reforms, whereas post-conflict states should be especially likely to adopt gender mainstreaming reforms. And then finally, um, kind of bringing in 1325, if 1325 has been effective in changing the kind of normative structure of how we view the role of women within the security sector, we should expect that given its emphasis on conflict, that conflict and post-conflict states should be especially more likely to adopt these reforms after the passing of UNSCR 1325. Okay, so in order to test these hypotheses, I collected data of 150 states between 1988 and 2016, and I recorded their history of gender reform policies um, during that time. And it's important to note that I was only collecting data on the adoption of policies, not whether the policies were implemented over time. Um, using this data, I created two, and sorry for any of you who hate statistics, but I ran statistical models, so I'm going to have to talk a little statistics quickly. Um, I created two main dependent variables, so these are the outcomes that I'm looking to test. Um, the first was whether a gender balancing reform was adopted within the state year, and the second was, was whether a gender mainstreaming reform was um, passed, or sorry, adopted within the state year. I then tested whether there was a correlation between a state's conflict status and the adoption of these reforms. I had two different kind of indicators of a state's conflict status. The first was one I called conflict effective. And this is basically whether the state is either actively experiencing a civil war with 25 battle deaths or more, or has experienced a civil war within the past 10 years. So I included those within the same category. And then the second set of independent variables that I used separated that conflict status out into active conflict and post-conflict. Um, and for anyone who is interested, and I can explain more for the modeling if anybody is interested in that, I can answer that during the Q&A, um, but I use logistic regression with state clustered standard errors and a number of controls to account for other things that might be affecting whether or not a state adopts these gendered security sector reforms. So overall, the results do show that conflict status is correlated with the adoption of these gendered security sector reform policies. And in particular, what it shows is that conflict-affected states, so these are when you combine conflict and post-conflict in the same category, that they are about 8% more likely to adopt gender, both gender balancing and gender mainstreaming reforms than non-conflict states. When we separate it out, the results are generally consistent. However, we do see that post-conflict states are not more likely to adopt gender balancing reforms than non-conflict states, that is unique to active conflict states, which again, if we consider that gender balancing may be driven primarily by the swelling ranks of um, the security sector after conflict, we may expect that as the security sector shrinks, we will no longer need that gender balancing reform. But we do see that again, both at post-conflict and active conflict states are more likely to adopt gender mainstream reforms than non-conflict states. And then finally, how am I doing on time? Okay. And then um, finally, I ran a number of models in which I looked at whether this relationship, this correlation between um, conflict status and the adoption of these reforms changed when we considered whether or not we were looking at before 1325 was adopted or after 1325. And there are a number of interesting results, some of which were not really what I was expecting. First, we see that non-conflict states were the most receptive to 1325. We saw that it was non-conflict states that changed their behavior most significantly from before 1325 to suddenly beginning to adopt both gender balancing and gender mainstream reforms after 1325. So that may imply that 1325 did successfully change the behavior, the ideas, and the normative um, values of non-conflict states. What kind of is surprising is some of the results of um, the conflict-affected states. And you know, once again, it's with gender balancing. And in it, we see that, again, post-conflict states are not more likely to adopt gender balancing reforms after the adoption of 1325. So it doesn't seem that post-conflict states saw from 1325 that they needed, to, they needed to take these steps to increase women's representation within the security sector. Um, that's something 
a, a result that surprised me quite a bit from some of my other work. Um, however, it may again indicate that gender balancing is mostly affected by this pragmatic need for personnel and not so much by the normative changes of 1325. However, we do see that 1325 did change um, in a statistically significant way the behavior of post-conflict states and that we see that after 1325, post-conflict states are much more likely to adopt gender mainstreaming reforms than post-conflict states were before 1325, um, where they were about 33% likely to adopt a gender mainstreaming reform before 1325. Afterwards, they're about 50% likely to adopt one of these reforms. Um, so just to kind of conclude, in general, these kind of results, I think, really speak to two things. First, I think they have a relatively hopeful um, indication or implication for the effect of 1325, and that they do indicate that 1325 did appear to change the behavior of non-conflict states and post-conflict states. However, it does appear that the effectiveness, perhaps more than normative effectiveness, of 1325 is limited when it comes to active conflict states. But this is in line with um, some of the work that we've already referenced in which during conflict, states often become more militarized and therefore more masculinized, which goes against the gender reform um, kind of values. Um, but so that may indicate that as we move forward, we should really be focusing how we can sell the idea of WPS to states that are actively experiencing conflict. And then finally, kind of moving forward, since the study has shown that country context does play a role in affecting who adopts these reforms, I hope to in the future look at how it then affects whether or not the reforms are successfully implemented, um, particularly looking at whether or not if the reform was adopted due to internal or external pressure, how that affects whether or not it is unsuccessfully implemented. And that is all for me. All right, thank you. Thank you. Well, panel, we Sarah Schroeder. That's going to be hard to follow. Um, I'd like to echo everyone else and say thank you for the opportunity uh, the Naval War College has allowed me to, or afforded me to speak about my thesis, Millennium Challenge Corporation, MCC, as a model for UN resolution enforcement to promote economic reform of marginalized populations. Uh, please note that women are a huge subset of the classification marginalized population by MCC. I too do not wish to offend anybody. Uh, mine will be a shock to your system, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> I'd like to ask the audience a question. Please raise your hand if you think the UN resolutions are purposeful and enforceable. Thank you. <laughs> resolutions have a duty, but they lack enforceability. I am going to list some facts to set the tone. As stated in the UN General Assembly, the effective rate of resolutions for 2017 is only expected to be about 55% for some of the top monetary contributors collectively for peacekeeping operations. The UN published that all members of the United Nations agree to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council. While other organs of the United Nations make recommendations to member states, only the Security Council has the power to make decisions that member states are then obligated to implement under the Charter. I am obligated to pay taxes that the government expects in exchange for my right as a U.S. citizen, but I could ignore such a demand by not paying taxes until they catch me. That's essentially what the member states are doing. Agreeing to resolutions bound by the obligation under Article 25 of the Charter, but knowingly and willfully ignoring them. The UN is recycling and redressing resolutions without actually addressing the problem of enforcement. A great example is the UN Security Council's response to the Syrian crisis. In total, 23 resolutions have been implemented since 2012. If the same resolutions are working, why would we need to keep coming up with new ones to address the same issue? Earlier this week, the Washington Express reports that Carla Del Pont a former war, war crimes prosecutor who said Sunday she is resigning from the UN's Independent Commission of Inquiry on Syria because of the Security Council's inaction on holding criminals, criminals accountable in the war-battered country. She told Swiss magazine Blick, 
we have had absolutely no success. For five years, we've been running up against walls. The U.S. contributes more to the U.N. than any other nation. It comprises 22% of the regular budget and more than 28% of the peacekeeping budget. This is $10 billion every year with no return on investment. Millennium Challenge Corporation has spent $10 billion overall since its inception 13 years ago with a return on investment using their model for policy reform, building infrastructure, preventing the marginalized populations from torture, and stimulating the econ economy all at the same time. Analysts that have spoken with diplomats indicate that at this time there is no singular or joint entity, either domestically or foreign, that will pick up the tab if the U.S. pulls out. Of these countries, my thesis looks at Afghanistan, Burundi, Sri Lanka, Sudan, and Syria, and what resolution enforcement would look like. To review the economic landscape of each country, I used reputable tools such as the Heritage Foundation Index of Economic Freedom, the World Economic Forum's Global Competitive Index, and the Hofstede Model. The fact remains that only three out of five of these countries have a baseline by Hofstede or by WEF. The country ratings were repressed, mostly on free or not graded. Only one of these has a compact started with MCC, and that's as of December 2016. What's worse is that all five of these countries are members of the UN with resolutions attached to address the current situation. Is it because these countries are not relevant and or too dangerous to compile information on? Think about the countries in Africa. If we were to assist in creating a stable landscape for the marginalized populations, we would not only benefit from an economic standpoint, but from capitalizing on untapped resources, like rare earth materials, that we require from a national security perspective where China may be the sole provider. No one has offered a solution to the problem, but yet the problem keeps getting discussed over and over. The UN is an outdated system that no longer serves the same purpose it once was established for. We must do something to help the marginalized populations from being tortured, isolated in poverty, held back from financial independence, and free from fear of starvation and death on a regular basis. How do you propose we do this? My thesis proposes that the UN adopt the Millennium Challenge Corporation Business Model Framework and use the UN Integrated Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, to enable a third-party UN enforcement arm, aka a court, that will ensure resolution compliance and promote economic security through infrastructure development and policy reform so the marginalized populations of the world are able to rise simultaneously as the elite. My theory is not an attempt to recreate the wheel. It's taking a fresh approach to generating the synergy among a group of resources not fully aligned before and leveraging the financial punch already thrown by the U.S. but in a different manner. The U.S. needs to paint the picture of what it would like, look like if they walked away with 22% of the budget. We have already threatened to reduce funding from certain areas, but instead use the financial clout to leverage what the catastrophic outlook would be if we pulled out permanently, then perhaps threaten to do so, and be prepared to walk away as we are dumping $10 billion down the drain every year. This will force other countries to step up to the plate both monetarily as well as adhering to the resolutions. In addition, countries would have no other option than to comply with the new set of rules laid before them. If not, they will be ejected from the UN arena. Globally, no one has time to deal with defiance in the realm of security for the marginalized populations and stunting global economic growth. The states would be in reaction mode, attempting to find out how they will function when 22% of the UN budget leaves the table. The answer is, it won't. In January, UNGA raised the budget for 2017 to 5.6 billion. The way I see it, the member states have only one choice. This on the assumption the U.S. heeds my advice. The states must comply with resolutions that are monitored and enforced through a third party and increase individual contributions or be forced out of this elite interpay to play circle that has the economic, financial, as well as military clout to isolate a singular country into non-existence. The UN needs to adopt MCC's approach to treating it as a business. Countries go directly to MCC requesting monetary assistance for infrastructure and security in varying forms with the attempt to adhere to the policy reform MCC mandates as conditions to receiving said assistance. Think of the UN as MCC and the countries that are part of the UN asking for assistance in the form of resolutions are like the countries coming to MCC for help. 
The countries in the UN must adhere to the resolutions that are adopted or face consequences by the proposed court above, including being expelled from the lead circle of 193 member states. MCC is already entrenched in the UN as the UN Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, slated to transform the world by 2030, which were based off of the MCC Millennium Development Goals, MDGs. Every member state was tasked with a segment to meet said goals. In turn, the UN already sees MCC as a catalyst and policy developer for change through partnership and enforcement. Knowing that the MDGs morphed into the SDGs highlights the underlying synergy between MCC and the UN. The foundation has already been laid and putting an MCC-style judgeship in charge of ruling, monitoring, as well as affirming a member state's reaction to resolutions is the correct way to proceed forward, as the current UNSC does not own enforcement due to political entanglements and policy-bound directives. The UN is trying to be everything to everybody, which becomes too generalized and results in forfeiting power over a single lane of authority to its six different groups slash organs like the UNSC. As clearly stated thus far, the bottom line is that the UN faces internal issues that cannot be fixed without an independent, non-biased oversight committee that will treat each violation accordingly as directed by a specified set of rulings. It will be absolved and shielded from political rhetoric as the role of each judge would be quite simple. One, the Judiciary Council would be an extension of the already established UN International Court of Justice, CIJ or ICJ which is the principal judicial organ of the UN. We shall dub the, the seventh organ, and call it the UN Resolution Court, UNRC. The UNCIJ would remain an entity, but now roll up to the UNRC. The UNRC would handle UN resolution violations with the responsibility of enforcement. This organ will have a larger overreach as the resolutions are voted on by all members, and the members are obligated under Article 25 of the Charter to comply. It will no longer be an obligation, but rather complying will be a requirement to maintain the right to be a member state of the UN. This, the reason that the CIJ will not absorb the right and remain separate is that it is only concerned with legal disputes submitted that are between two states, as well as giving advice on legal questions when there is still a need for it and as not all disputes involve every member state. Two, the committee would go through nominations and elections for each position of the court and endure a voting by member state peers. It will begin by each nation going through a process to draw up candidates to be the elected judge for the member state. Then the member states would hold primary elections to identify who will be the individual in the general election going against other member state primary election winners. Member states already vote on resolutions as a, as a democracy, so this would not be a new concept to them. We, three, we will keep the widely popular number of 15 that the UNSC and UNCIJ deem favorable. However, the 15 judges will be subject to elections and all will be active participants, with the 15th judge breaking a tie vote on any given judgment regarding a resolution violation. There will no longer be five permanent members with veto power plus 10 non-permanent members representing 193 member states. It will be 15 elected judges with three-year terms as enough happens in three years to be seasoned and to react to the violations by member states in a timely manner. In turn, 15 countries will be elected by their peers to maintain the judgeship every three years and as in any election, any country who is a primary candidate entered into the general election will be applicable. As they say, or maybe it's just me, permanent positions with veto power were so last year. This has been a long time coming due to the political entrenchment that the UN has allowed to happen. If the UN wants to talk in circles due to more emphasis being on political figures, then this will either highlight the elephant in the room or force countries to get the right individuals into the right positions by forcing diplomatic and transparent communications between states. Seeing as how we need change yesterday, my suggestion would be to implement the new structure my thesis proposes beginning in 2018 and line it up with the next adjustments to its scale of assessments by the UNGA. This means start now. Line out the project milestones for reform, place them into an agenda for completion, and task out rules to monitor progress and ensure completion. I would venture to say that the lack of true enforcement in the UN resolution process is the definition of insanity or doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Resolutions seem to come back to a need for politics and a want of establishing democracy. If resolutions are enforced, then democracy can be built. 
and if democracy can be built, then policy reform can occur. Policy reform will give and enforce rights of the country's citizens and stimulate the economy by reducing the number of people fleeing their country. Playing by MCC's rules will result in infrastructure development for the hard to reach areas if the country complies with policy reform regulations. Refugees will return to their country if hope is given for a better life with the right to own property, not be the property of another individual, be an entrepreneur, and free from torture. There are three core principles to the MCC model. First, since they believe policy matters, MCC funding is performance-based. Second, they believe that foreign aid should be predicated on partnership and not paternalism. MCC funding requires country ownership. Third, since they are interested in outcomes, MCC insists upon tangible, meaningful, and sustainable results. I think this approach would work the same for resolutions and that the U.S. is investing in the U.N. and each resolution should be treated like a compact or threshold project. The countries need to take ownership of implementation and put a larger portion of the budget. The UN would fall apart without US investment. To me, this means enforcement would foster empowerment for development and create opportunities for the US, its businesses, as well as other countries to open up trade discussions with other countries who are relatively inaccessible or secure. NCC forms partnerships with some of the world's poorest countries, but only those committed to good governance, economic freedom, and investments in their citizens I think this falls right in line with the UN resolutions, as they are commitments by the member states of the UN as a group to implement the same traits in a country that MCC forms partnerships with countries for. The UN enforcement would force countries to meet conditions for investments. MCC uses an economic rate of return, ERR, to identify which projects and countries to choose for compacts and threshold programs. MCC states, at its core, ERR is a comparison of the cost and benefits of a public investment. I think the U.S. should look through the business lens and view the U.N. as a public investment that should have an estimated and expected return on investment. MCC is extremely transparent in how it issues foreign assistance to promote good governance practices and government decision making. MCC's methodology for ERR analysis is best described as microeconomic growth analysis, which measures the expected increases in household incomes or the value added of individual firms. I have stated that I think the U.S. needs to view the U.N. like MCC would as a country for investment. If the U.N. member states are not upholding the implementation of resolutions in their countries, then the U.N. would use the new judgeship that I suggested and as a means of action would kick out the countries that are not complying with the rules. It's that simple. No one wants to leave the U.N. as it doesn't provide a conduit for trade, development, and alliance building. In turn, I think countries would heed the U.S.'s warning if they threaten to pull funding unless this new structure is implemented. <clears throat> MCC speaks to the fact that work in one country has the likeness to spread to other countries, which would imply economic stimulus is contagious and will build regional cooperation. As discussed earlier, the MCC values are already ingrained in the U.N. as the U.N. Sustainable Development Goals, slated to transform the world by 2030, were based off of MCC's MDGs. MCC, by contract, works to eliminate obstacles and reduce risks in our partner countries to encourage business investment and accelerate, accelerate economic growth and alleviate poverty. In conclusion, I'm not saying that my way is the right way, but I am saying that the current system is not working. We need to do more and buck status quo. Time for four questions. I know it's a challenge given the, the wide variety and the interest of the presentations, but let's start. Oh, come now. <laughs> All right, so for Laura Coburn, uh, I'm curious to know if your research went into uh, the balance of those countries that have conscriptive service to those that have the voluntary service. Uh, I think those Um, at the moment, it hasn't. Um, as I move forward with the project, I do plan that I'm going to do a closer look at how the militaries are constructed and particularly how they recruit um, their officers as well as their previous or, for lack of a better word, their current gender standing. Um, so, you know, 
theoretically, security sectors that are already relatively gender equitable don't need to adopt gender reforms. Um, although, from you know, looking at the data, that's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that countries are adopting these gender reforms at a relatively equal rate across relatively more equitable countries and less equitable countries. But I have not yet looked at how the country, the military itself, does their um, recruitment. So that is a good idea of something to look forward to in the future. Yeah. In the back. Um, my question is for Dr. Lay. So Beth, one of your recommendations was inclusion of gender in more exercises. So then you talked about the need for exercise of designers and planners to understand gender. Um, do you have any recommendations on how to go about getting the planners and the um, exercise designers more involved in this area? So I went to our observer trainers and said, okay, this is what we need to do. You need to look for these in the exercises. And they said, okay, great, I understand, good concept. But we don't plan the exercises. So I went to the exercise planners and said, this is what you need to do to plan the exercises. And I said, okay, great, but I understand it, good thing, but we don't request it. We need to go on what the combat command or whoever is requesting the exercise, and then we'll design it and include it in there. So every month we have a monthly BTC that Suzanne uh, does coordinate, and we go out to the people and often I'll tell them, hey, if you want this included in your exercises, you have to go to your exercise planners and make sure this is included within the exercises. Recently, one of our other exercise planners came to me and said, hey, well, the exercise designers who are our contract force need to understand what this concept is also. So they may be able to, without any you know, overall knowledge, be able to include it just kind of surreptitiously. And so it's there without really being requested because we're having that struggle. And so we need to do a top-down and a bottom-up approach. And so that's just getting the word out more. Thank you. Um, it's not really a question to Sarah, but to thank you for your very explosive um, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> take, and it was a completely accurate take on the UN, unfortunately. Um, and to give you some more ammunition, I think that something that your organization or your, your theory could also say is that when you're um, looking at each country and seeing if they meet their UN mandates on the resolutions, you could also get this court to look and um, hold to account for soldiers who are committing sexual exploitation and abuse because at the moment it's done internally by each nation and for me it, this seems to be a bit of an error because unfortunately things are being pushed under the carpet so that's just some strength and that's a segue to a question to Laura um, have you considered that um, countries which have a good architecture in women, peace and security might have had an internal sexual exploitation and abuse problem. And I say that on thin ice, but I can see that some countries which are really good at this, that they've got their gender advisors, are in some way recoiling from an internal scandal. And I'd be interested to if any other countries are doing that. Um, I have definitely found evidence that some countries there will be some kind of scandal and then as a result they do suddenly adopt you know, the sexual harassment policy, sexual exploitation policy to try to recruit more women and they, they have this reactionary um, push to adopt all these gender reforms. Um, I have not yet tested, tried to find like an actual statistical correlation um, partially because I can't find accurate data of those kind of scandals happening within the military. Um, I have, I am attempting to record when I find evidence. Sometimes, you know, when it makes it to the media, I can find evidence of those things happening, and so I have some anecdotal evidence. Um, I don't have any kind of hard statistical evidence at the moment, um, but I definitely do think in some countries that is the case. We have time for one more question. I have one. I would say I have one. Oh, we have one. No, that's mine. Go ahead. I have a question for Laura. Looking forward into the implementation piece, you said you were going to be tracking how those uh, gender balancing or gender mainstream reforms are implemented. Are you going to be taking into account, um, you talked about how close conflict states, there are a lot of international players that can have a role in then introducing those gender reforms. Did any of your research track how those forms were adopted? based on the role of an international player, and are you going to look at that in your implementation piece as well? 
Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so when I was collecting the data on the adoption of the reforms, I had to see evidence that it was a government-driven reform. So if the reform appeared to be driven almost entirely by the UN or by um, civil society or NGO, that was not included within my data set. Um, it gets murky, especially in post-conflict states, because sometimes the UN has such a strong role, um, or these civil societies actors have such a strong role within the security sector reform <laughs> that they overlap in who is actually adopting the policy. But I had to see evidence that it was the government actually participating in the adoption of the reform. That being said, I do think that um, these international actors play a big role in the implementation. Um, and moving forward, I do plan to track, um, for example, what the level of the UN presence or civil society presence was within the country to see how that then affects whether it's implemented in the long term. Um, I haven't been able to do that as of yet, um, but that is something I'm planning to do moving forward. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you.